Choosing a tomato is a lot like dating. <laughs> you tend to go for the pretty ones. But just like with people, there's more to a tomato than just looks. And just, how, just like we want our human relationships to nourish our souls, we should want our food relationships to nourish our bodies. I hope by the end of this talk, I'll have given you a little insight and know-how to help you start picking your food as well as I'm sure you pick your partners. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe better. <laughs> My story starts in Wisconsin, where I grew up in a small town surrounded by cornfields. I had no direct ties to agriculture, except for a few high school classmates that were, came from farm families. You could tell who they were, they were the ones walking down the hallways with the overalls. But then again, this was the early 90s and a trend came along where overalls became in fashion and then you couldn't tell, it looked like everybody was a farmer. But I went on to study finance and then I started my career in Chicago as an investment banker. Never would I have thought I would have moved to LA, let alone become a tomato farmer. But in the year 2000, I moved out to LA uh, to go get my MBA with the intention of getting involved in a, in a high-tech startup. After all, this was the height of the dot-com boom. But the boom went bust, and next thing I knew, I was in the world of agriculture. <laughs> I started out, started out in a hybrid seed breeding company. And then from there, we started farming. And we started growing tomatoes, hydroponically, conventionally, and organically and selling those tomatoes to local restaurants, few supermarkets, but primarily at the local farmers markets. I now manage certified farmers markets and head a nonprofit promoting and encouraging using locally sourced fruits and vegetables as part of a healthy diet. My, my career path pretty much resembles the path of a tomato as it goes from a seed to your plate. <laughs> and from that, I've learned a lot about tomatoes and a lot about our food system. Like most, I took our food system for granted. I thought that it selected the best tomato for us, but I was wrong. From my experience, I've seen firsthand the realities of our food system. And the fact is that today, we have a very superficial relationship with our food. Our relationship is based more on aesthetics, like color, size, and shape, than nutrition. And our health is paying the price for this. A recent study was presented to the United States Senate. It highlighted the problems with our nation's soil, and the fact that because of our intensive farming practices, our soil has been depleted of essential minerals. And it linked these minerals to potential health problems. And the study concluded that without something changing, an imminent health crisis would occur. Now, when I say this is a recent study, I mean 76 years ago. This was presented to the United States Senate in 1936. Not much has been done in those past 76 years to help stop this crisis from happening. Today, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, plague this country, and there's not much being done about it. The University of Texas conducted a study, and they looked at vegetables from 50 years ago, as well as vegetables today. And they found that the mineral content of vegetables has decreased by up to 40% or more over that time period. Other studies have found similar results or even greater results. I was curious about this, so I kind of did my own research. And I went to the USDA website and pulled up some statistics available from 1963 to today and found basically the exact same things when it comes to, to my friend, the tomato. Bottom line is that our food system is failing us and we're letting it happen. We need to do something about it, and I think we can with the power of our fork. <laughs> I never thought I'd be voting with my fork, let alone standing here encouraging you to vote with yours. 
But here I am asking you to vote with your fork to go out and find a mutually beneficial food relationship. In fact, I'm encouraging you to go out and find several relationships. After all, monogamy is not a social constraint in the food world. <laughs> in fact, it's encouraged. So go out, and when it comes to nutritious foods, go out and be a hedonist. And from my experience, you're not going to find hedonism in the produce aisle of your local supermarket. You're going to find it at your local farmer's market. So when it comes to healthy relationships with the food and nutrition, it's difficult because nutrition is invisible. But there are some factors that we can consider that will help us point us in the right direction to where a nutritious, healthy relationship can be found. Some of the factors include the seed variety, the growing practices, the ripeness when harvested, and post-harvest handling, storage, and transportation. And as you'll see as we go through these, that the, your local supermarket is at a significant disadvantage when it comes to your local farmer's market. I started out in the seed world, and some of you may be asking, what is hybrid seed? What is seed breeding? I could go and talk about Gregor Mendel and his experiment with the pea plant and breeding it and talking about dominant and recessive traits, but that would probably conjure up memories of your third grade science class. <laughs> instead, to keep it simple, let's, instead of thinking about two tomatoes, let's think about two dogs, a Labrador and a poodle. And you crossbreed the two, and you come up with a hybrid, and that hybrid is a Labradoodle. And hopefully that Labradoodle has the qualities from those two parents that you were looking for. So in a nutshell, that's vegetable seed breeding. <laughs> Spent eight years to learn that. <laughs> for over the past 50 years, vegetables have been intensely bred for superficial qualities. And it's because of this inbreeding that some people estimate that your commercial hybrid tomato now only represents about 5% of the genetic characteristics it once had. So how can we expect a tomato to fully express itself when it only has 5% of its gene pool to work with? <laughs> After spending eight years in the industry, I know that the, the goals of the industry are noble. They try to seek to provide value to everybody in the value chain, the farmer, the distributor, the retailer, and you, the consumer. Unfortunately, no one has placed the value on nutrition. And so it's disregarded and concerned more about other aesthetic and economically tangible qualities, such as yield, resistance to pests, uniformity, etc. The most dominant effort is for yield. And rightfully so, a farmer gets paid by volume. So the more product, that is yielded, the more revenue for the farmer, which is good. But the realities of the industry are disappointed. And because people have found, evidence shows that with um, breeding for yield, although your plants and crops may grow bigger and faster, they don't necessarily uptake the nutrients from the soil at that same faster rate. And so once again, nutrition is being sacrificed. When it comes to dating, you should trust your gut. When it comes to food, you should trust your taste buds. Taste has a direct link to the nutritional content of food. It's an evolutionary survival mechanism we have. When I was growing tomatoes, I, grow, I grew both conventionally and organically. So you'll probably be surprised when I tell you that I'm not a huge proponent of the organic label. Note that I said the organic label. Organic as a philosophy is wonderful and something I wholeheartedly support and promote. Unfortunately, it's been corrupted by the food industry. Now it's not much more than a marketing term. A marketing term that lets you know pretty much only what a farmer is not doing, that he's not using synthetic chemicals or fertilizers. But doesn't, the regulations fail to address the equally important part that a farmer needs to replenish the nutrients in the soil and replenish it in a, in a sustainable way. The problem with labels is that 
we start trusting them. And once we start trusting them, we stop asking questions. So this is a problem for our food industry, because once we stop asking questions, our interest, we do not keep the interest of the food industry aligned with our own interest. So I encourage you to go to your local supermarket and start, stop ask, start asking questions to your local produce manager and see what kind of answers you can get. Ask what kind of growing practices were used on that head of cauliflower. Good luck finding an answer. <laughs> Just another reason why the deck is stacked against the commercial supermarket as opposed to the local farmer's market. Farmer's market, you have a direct line of communication with your farmer. You can ask them questions about their growing practices. And if you don't like what they say, you can go to the next booth and ask them. As I mentioned, flavor is a strong indicator of nutrition. And one of the biggest components determining flavor is when you pick a fruit off of the vine. When I was farming, we would typically wait till the tomato was fully ripe, and we would pick it within 24 hours and bring it to the local farmer's market. But the supermarket typically picks its tomatoes about two or three weeks prior to maturity, when it's still green and rock hard. And then, once it gets to its final destination, it gasses it with ethylene, which is a hormone that'll start the ripening process. People found out about this and they reacted. And the industry was forced to react. An example of the power of the fork. And so they created the term vine ripened, which essentially just means that you've waited to pick the fruit until it just starts breaking color, as showed by the breaker example up there. And as long as you do that, the tomato will start ripening, will continue to ripen on its own, and you won't have to use the gas, which is good, but the vine ripen term is a little bit misleading. It kind of makes you think that it's kept on the vine until maturity, which isn't the case. Supermarket is full of lots of creativity, such as, <laughs> such as waxing the tomato. Humans are attracted to shiny things. And so they wax your fruit to make it look shiny. And how about the misters at the supermarket? They go off every couple minutes. Have any of you ever opened up your refrigerator and sprayed water on your produce? <laughs> Do you think that's going to make it last longer? No, that makes it rot faster. But it makes it look shiny and attractive to the eyes, and it creates a sense of freshness. So. Considering all these variables, it's no wonder that, the supermar that the, your local farmer's market has a significant advantage over your local supermarket. And it's why I fell in love with the farmer's market. And it was where I got, first got introduced to the heirloom tomato, which I fell in love with. Heirloom is affectionately known as the ugly tomato. Um, but it's mostly just ugly for the commercial food system that can't adapt to its odd shape, its lack of uniformity, its low perishability, and its low yield, which are all detriments to the economics of their food system. But I fell in love with the heirloom because of its flavor, and that's why it's passed down from generation to generation. And with that flavor, you are getting the nutritional benefits. It's a link between the two. And the heirloom also attracted my attention because it was basically a little business school case study that I got to experience firsthand. Because when people first started tasting the heirloom, they just went nuts and they just demanded it. So our farm went from planting about 500 tomato plants to planting over 10,000 within just a couple years. And I saw it happen at the farmer's market as well. Starting out with just one tomato farmer having it, selling heirlooms, within just a year or two, every single tomato farmer started selling heirlooms. And even farmers that didn't grow tomatoes started growing them and selling them. So it really was a demonstration of the power of your fork. But the real 
The real explosion happened when the heirloom made the leap from the farmer's market to your supermarket. The supermarket heard your voice. It heard that you were demanding flavor, and it adapted. It had to change its tomato box. It had to change a whole bunch of other structural things in order to get that tomato into the supermarket. But they heard you, and that's the power of your fork. The heirloom kind of making its way into the supermarket was a nutritional breakthrough. Now sure, the, the nutritional side of it was a little bit of a, a side because the, the dominant effort was the flavor. But it showed the power of, our, of your fork. And hopefully it'll start prompting the question of, <laughs> start prompting the question of which food is more nutritious? And hopefully you'll start asking that question. And I hope someday I'll be able to answer it by saying, oh, there's an app for that. <laughs> and there probably will be. Uh, but until that day, I'll go on and tell the story of how an heirloom tomato changed my life and how I think the farmer's market can change yours. So I encourage each and every one of you to go get involved in a food relationship. I know it's scary to get involved in a committed relationship, but, but take the plunge. And if you need help, just ask. Because there's, there's a lot of food matchmakers out there like myself that would love to tell you the stories about their food relationships. And the farmer's market's a good place to start. So I hope to see you there.